Uh, okay, so in terms of the the questions, um, how do we, you know, for example, how do we overcome siloing in higher education and disseminate effective inter integrated processes for societal transformation? I'll split my comments into two sections. One talking about an objective reality uh, framework for, that can be used to guide the development of societal transformation processes, and another one about changes needed in education to facilitate societal transformation. So we've discussed this, these subjects extensively in our societal transformation group at the World Academy of Arts and Science, something that was started right after WASA's 60th anniversary celebration in February. And many people say that we know what we want, but we don't know how to get it. So that leads to a focus on societal transformation processes. And that's true, we know at a high level what we want. Most people would say we want humanity to survive and prosper over the longer term. But when you think of all the challenges we face and the many actions needed, the complexity can become overwhelming, which can kind of sap the enthusiasm needed for transformation. For example, in Petra's excellent recent paper about repurposing capitalism, she identified many different actions needed for societal transformation, a key question is how do we coordinate those uh, coordinate those actions? So address that to address that, I'd like to emphasize a key point, which is the distinction between uh, system change content or process. And content should take priority. Content uh, effectively is the change that you want. The process is the way to achieve it. So for societal transformation. The content would be the qualities of sustainable society, the endpoint, what we're trying to achieve, and the major changes and actions needed to get there. Once that's clear, then you can develop effective processes for achieving it and use that as a structure to integrate all the thousands, if not millions of different actions needed to achieve societal transformation. So um, having this kind of clarity a vision and the way to get there builds enthusiasm for uh, societal transformation because people can cut through the complexity and have a clear understanding of how to get to the destination. It facilitates the development of effective processes and, and, and gives us a framework for coordinating the many different actions. So, uh, and my suggestion for education would be that this content be clarified uh, throughout all levels of education, not just higher education that we teach from a young age about the integrated whole system of humanity, what it looks like in sustainable form and the major actions needed to get there. And I think a key issue would be to help young people understand three questions. What's happening in society? Why is it happening? And how do we solve the problems? So at a summary level, what's happening is that we're violating the laws of nature. So our systems are collapsing. The reason it's happening is that our reductionistic thinking has developed flawed systems uh, that force, force us to degrade the environment and society. And the solution is to adopt higher level whole system thinking, use that to produce sustainable systems that compel us to abide by the laws of nature. So um, to do that, we need an objective reality framework uh, for societal transformation. The SDGs provide one definition of sustainability, but it's an incomplete vision. It doesn't address everything. Uh, they're human-centric instead of nature-centric, which in, a, in that sense means they're not based on reality, and they don't uh, discuss how to achieve the goals. Um, one, uh, in my Global System Change books, I laid out a three-part simple uh, framework for societal transformation. The first part is using the laws of nature to define sustainable society. These include qualities that are always present in living systems. When they're not present, the system dies or changes. These go beyond human philosophies. They're matters of objective reality. They will completely determine the extent to which humanity survives on this planet, not the SDGs, the laws of nature. These include things like equitable resource distribution, widespread cooperation, decentralizing uh, production governance, equally valuing generations and species, producing no waste, living off of renewable resources, and enabling individuals to reach their fullest potential. Also implied operating principles of sustainable systems are equality, full cost accounting, and uh, full employment. So 
with the end state clear at a high level, the next step would be to define the systemic changes needed to get there. Three principles to do that would be emulate nature, democracy, and the rule of law. The answers to how to evolve human systems are implied or shown in, in natural systems in almost every case. Democracy is the only sustainable form of government because it's based on people's innate rights to equality and self-government. And uh, the rule of law is a perfect example of, of a simple framing mechanism to make a complex system change understandable. There are many different economic and political system flaws that force companies to degrade the environment and society. These are the root causes of climate change and other problems. If, if you rolled them all up into one overarching system flaw, it would be the failure to hold companies fully responsible for negative impact. In competitive markets, this makes it impossible for companies to stop harming the environment and society and remain in business. If they do, their costs go up and they go out of business. So the rule of law says, do what you want, but don't hurt anyone. Our systems massively violate that by allowing companies to cause harm. So, if, and it does this in many ways, externalities, time value of money, limited liability, they all roll up to not, to not holding companies responsible. So if the meta flaw is not held responsible, the meta solution is hold companies responsible. That's a simple, even not debatable concept that everyone can understand. It's a good way to frame up a simple uh, solution. Okay, now in terms of um, the, the third part is once you identify the end state, the systemic changes needed to get there, like holding companies responsible, then the third part is what are the actions needed to bring about these changes? They're needed in all areas, the general public, government, and corporate financial. This framework leads to the development of effective processes. One quick example of, of a process that results from clear content is system change investing. Companies have great power to drive system change. They're largely controlled by investing. We've been using investing successfully for 20 years to engage companies in sustainability. We can use the same approach to engage them in system change by rating them on system change performance, shifting investments based on that. This is going to um, incentivize companies to do a lot of things that they're not incentivized to do now, like go to government and ask to be held more responsible instead of less to work with media to end the civil war between conservatives and liberals in the US. That's probably the largest problem in our country. It makes people unable to work together on their many common interests. So we can begin to rate companies on, are they supporting media that divides citizens or unites them? So with that kind of, um, that kind of framework, I think is essential for coordinating uh, and developing effective societal transformation processes. In the few minutes I have left, let me just touch on education um, for societal transformation. A major principle is that education follows society. In other words, education does what society is focused on. So our systems um, are focused on maximizing economic growth and shareholder returns that concentrates wealth and powers. So our educational system needs to be able to compel the many to work for the benefit of the few. Um, our system is a legacy of the Protestant Reformation and the Industrial Revolution. The goals were, and largely still are, uh, indoctrination and obedience training. So our educational systems uh, teach young people to obey authorities, not question prevailing ideas, and uh, tolerate boring jobs for the rest of their lives. It's, you know, it would be a good structure for a totalitarian society. It does this in many ways. Uh, competitive grading, for example, weakens young people's self-esteem and social and emotional skills. It teaches them competition instead of the overwhelming cooperation of sustainable systems. It teaches them to see peers as obstacles to their success. And it makes children with average and below average grades feel inadequate. Um, standardized curriculums teach them that their own interests are not important. They should focus on what authorities say is important. They're um, constantly monitored, monitored, strictly disciplined. Uh, they are, you know, some schools, their privacy is violated with online uh, things that collect their personal and, and performance information and then share it with others. Uh, some schools mandate psychiatric drug use for disruptive children. With high student debt, we take away the ability of young people's freedom to follow their lives and often have to take jobs they don't like. This is the result of a system that's focused on maximizing economic growth. 
If we switch our system to maximizing individual and collective well-being, it'll lead to massive changes in, in all, all levels of education. Uh, we'll focus on the most important things needed for life success, like building high self-esteem, strong social and emotional skills, critical thinking skills, and empowerment to follow one's life or follow one's bliss. Um, a key way to do this is freedom-based education. It's a well-established successful procedure that eliminates competitive grading, standardized curriculums, strict discipline, mandatory drug use. We'll fully fund higher education and make tuition free or low cost for public uh, schools. We, in the US, we should equally fund K through 12 education. Now we provide two to three times more funding for children in wealthy communities. Um, and we'll empower teachers and professors uh, one with, with adequate pay. A generation ago, most professors were tenured or on a tenure track. Now many of them are adjunct professors on po earning poverty level wages. This limits their freedom to uh, think independently and teach young people to do the same. We'll emulate leaders like Finland and we'll teach higher level reality-based whole system thinking. Teach young people to the interconnectedness of society, cooperation, empathy, wisdom, the qualities that are more associated with feminine. And by doing that, we'll elevate the, the status of women in society. So the bottom line is that um, providing clear system change content will e lead to effective processes.